This is the story of police officers not helping you because they can't be bothered. Miss Keys was crouching down on the floor and he had blood pouring out of his fucking wrist. No, I didn't see him. <laughs> this is the story of sexism at the heart of the police. This is the story of a female police officer who believes her own force doesn't help victims of rape. If I'm ever raped, then fucking hell, I'm not reporting it to the police. I'd rather do myself in because the help you get from these people are just ridiculous. This is the story of a public institution frustrated by endless paperwork. Oh, you don't, have, you don't go on CPS. And if you do, just poke the bitch's eyes out for me. And this is the woman who went undercover to show you the reality of policing in Britain. Tonight on Dispatches, Nina Hobson is the real secret policewoman. January 2006, and Nina Hobson arrives at Leicestershire Police Headquarters to receive an award for her outstanding performance as a police officer. Nina Hobson to come forward. Deputy Chief Constable David Lindley congratulates Nina and a colleague on their work. Their commitment to the victims of harassment was clear, as was their enthusiasm, which has made me extremely proud, as indeed it has the rest of the problem. Leicester's Chief Constable, Matt Baggett, presents the award himself. What neither he nor his deputy know is that Nina Hobson is an undercover reporter. As part of a dispatch's investigation, Nina had rejoined the police nine months earlier. At 35, and after a five-year career break, she was returning to a job she first started at 18. I'm actually quite scared. Um, not, I think it's more apprehension of actually seeing people that I already know um, and just making sure that I can still do the job because obviously that's priority, doing the job and, and doing my police role. During her first 11 years with the police, Nina rose to become a CID detective, picking up two police commendations along the way. But despite her success, she wasn't happy with the force when she left. Like many police officers, I became disillusioned with the organisation itself. I saw things that the public wouldn't see, the behind-the-scenes ways that the sexism, the bullying, and I went through that and lived through that. After five years working in TV and media, Nina is back in the police, this time for dispatches. But she finds things at the station haven't changed. Every shift starts with a briefing, but it's not police business that's the first item on the agenda. Nina's discovered officers often watch DVDs while in the station at night. Her sergeant throws in this suggestion. We've got any porn stars because there's no women here after midnight. That's a sexist comment, sergeant. There's no women here after midnight, so we can watch porn for a change. These officers are supposed to be patrolling the M1. Instead, they drop around to Nina's house. So how are you? Good. This is very nice. The two officers come around to see me because they're traffic officers. They normally work on the motorway. I happen to live um, probably 25 miles away from the motorway. They called in for a cup of tea. So where should you be then now? Where's it work? Between Junction 21 and Junction 18. No, you shouldn't. Where's South Midway car? Junction 21 and Junction 18. Junction like that. Video. I'm only part time, so I only get... I mean, I've got to show you this one. Is it sick? Yeah. The stuff that they showed me on their mobile phone was absolutely disgusting. I don't want to see anyone. No, nothing. They're disgusting. Oh, I know that one. You know, I know which one. Monica Pony. You know about I don't want to see any with ponies. <laughs> no, this, this one's different. It's not what you're thinking. <laughs> Seriously. That, that's it. Well, no, you can't, because if you don't want to Ex see it, Well, if you explain to her what I'm What do you think? 
Is it involving sex and a horse? Hmm. Let me see. have a look. Neil, I, see, you I think you've already relieved yourself, haven't you? Um, just go upstairs, you'll find it. It's not very big. It's this one here. Go around. He always has that problem. No, no, honestly. The, like that, the woman in that would die three days later. Because of what she did in this. Seven days earlier, the Home Secretary had announced plans to make possessing extreme pornography illegal. Oh my gosh! <laughs> While out and about, Nina found that at one local station, it's still accepted practice to display soft porn. Is it a male only office in here? I'm in the process of taking stuff down. Wait, wait, is it? Is there any females work down here? Uh, only, um... No! <laughs> Everywhere. Porn and male police officers seem to go hand in hand. I don't know whether it's worse, it's certainly not better. Um, sexism is still very, very high. I think probably it's classed as being more acceptable now. That women who are in the police force now, you accept that the way that you're going to be spoken to or the things that are said to you and it's acceptable banter and the males tend to think if you don't agree with it, you shouldn't be in the job. It's not just PCs with porn that Nina encountered. She also found that being a woman defined her job in a way she found unacceptable. Here, a sergeant makes it plain to Nina he thinks women are not up to controlling crowds on a busy Friday night and instead sends her on an errand. <laughs> And he said, I'm sorry, Nina, that I gave you that job, but at the end of the day, um, you were the woman. It's kicking out, Tom, and I want the blokes out on the streets for any fights that might happen. You not going to be sexist, but... I think I was just... Oh, what chance have I got? If that's how my sergeant... He's thinking that women basically aren't up to the job. What I saw was endemic sexism, um, but taken for granted every day, the real world. Uh, this is men's real world, where they objectify women, where they watch pornography, where um, they make jokes about women's bodies. How can they firstly respect the women officers who they work with because of that, but also deal respectfully with women who are coming in complaining about sexual violence? The sergeant isn't alone in believing some aspects of police work aren't suitable for women. So why didn't you want your girlfriend to join? There's certain aspects of this job that I don't think women should have to do it. I'm probably a bit old-fashioned when it comes to that. I don't think women should have to grapple around the street with pissets that shout and scream in the faces. I don't think women should have to deal with, like, other violent arseholes, you know. I guess it, I'm chauvinistic when it comes to that. I just think, you know, in an ideal world, it would be nicer if they didn't have to. Mm. Uh, there's other things, though, that I would shirk away from, like, dinner of a rape, for example. So, I guess, <laughs> it's like saying, women have got the uses. <laughs> it's not. Three months later, the same officer is confronted by a woman who says she's been raped. He decides to consult a senior officer on what to do before leaving the scene. What happened with that rape, David? Oh, it was supposedly genuine, wasn't it? Because mm. yeah. no, the last I heard it was, um, and then a load of others have come forward, describing the same bloke and the same MO. One force was while we were there. We spoke to her. Yeah. Just tell her that if she wants to report it, she reports it sort of next week when she's ready. Because uh, take this sort of thing and we finish the song. Who said that? This is it. Uh, okay. Thanks, in my, my experience, they'll, they'll come forward and talk about it. I like that one. Oh, okay. The officer who raises that comment was the first officer at the scene of a prostitute rape and when he was relaying the details to his senior officer, it was then that take it as a pinch of salt, meaning it's a prostitute, 
they do this all the time, it might not be genuine. If a young officer is getting that sort of instruction off a senior officer, what chance have we ever got of changing the attitude of particularly men in the police force to how they deal with a rape, be it a prostitute rape, a domestic rape or a stranger rape? They're all rapes. Less than 4% of rapes reported in Leicestershire are solved. 12 of the country's 43 police forces have a worse record. One night at the station, Nina uncovered the story behind just one of the people who make up those statistics. A colleague is upset at the failure to send a scene of crime officer, known by the acronym SOCO, to visit an alleged rape victim. I'm absolutely appalled. And she's rung you tonight? She's ringing me every day. I've got messages. I've got messages yesterday, I've got messages today, um, she's ringing me today. There's, there's, there's a towel to be seized, they didn't even send Socko round. Socko wasn't sent round. It, it might have happened on Tuesday. So what? There's still forensic evidence there on the settee. Socko still hasn't been round. They haven't sent Socko round, they haven't requested Socko. I find that quite startling. Um, in a case as serious as that, that, there's been a delay in sending a scenes of crime officer around who are called SOCO officers. Um, evidence such as that should be gathered as early as possible. I can't stress that enough. Home office figures show that the overall detection rate for all crime rises from 24% to 38% where DNA is recovered from a crime scene. In rape cases, it can make an even bigger difference. Here we see that potential evidence was not even gathered, let alone analysed. And I'm not just surprised at, that that didn't happen, but also that there was no supervisor who picked it up and said, why hasn't this happened? Theoretically, every rape case is supposed to be supervised by a senior investigative officer. So we have a failure at the investigative level and a failure at the supervision level. The PC talking to Nina doesn't think that the poor handling of this rape case is an isolated incident. I've gone through rapes, Nina, where I haven't spoken to anyone. When it's just happened. Then I've got silly bitches like saying domestic rapes, petty rape and all this, that and the other. I think she should be able to fuck it Who's that? I dealt with a one off the... Oh, they wouldn't send anyone yeah. to deal with ours. I went over to deal with one of theirs. And then um, it was it was horrific. This woman had gone through six months of being raped every weekend by her husband who just burst the news through the door. And we went there and she turned around to me and said, oh, that domestic rape should be dealt with this petty rape. You stupid bitch. Who is she? I mean, this this is almost reminiscent of the, of, of the bad old days of, um, that we, we saw back in the 1970s, I think it was, with Thames Valley Police, where people were actually dismissing and not dealing with um, rape cases in the way they should be. And it's very difficult um, to see any justification whatsoever for anybody taking an allegation of what they call domestic rape any less seriously than any other allegation of rape. It was like that when I was doing it. Well, what, what, what are we playing at? You've been in 12 years, for fuck's sake. Things should have changed after 12 years of bloody... What are we? I don't know. If, if I've been... I, I've just said, if I'm ever raped, then fucking hell, I'm not reporting it to the police. I don't know. I'd rather do myself in because the help you get from these people are just ridiculous. Things like rape, you still hear police officers saying she asked for it, she had a short skirt on. And I thought we might have moved on, but we quite clearly haven't from, from that. Coming up, at a time when the government wants value for money from the police, Nina is surprised by some of the late-night antics on duty. And she finds a novel use for squad cars. I haven't played hide-and-seek in a police car before.
Nina Hobson is a police officer with over 11 years' experience. For four months, she worked as a dispatcher's reporter and filmed officers working in Leicester city centre. Sexist attitudes she hoped had died, she found alive and kicking. Even the police themselves are disgusted at the way their organisation can treat a rape victim. The 290,000 people who live in Leicester each pay around 30 pence a day for the police. It's an expensive service to run. Nina's keen to find out if those taxpayers are getting their money's worth. The sergeant's told us to go and get a Chinese tonight for the shift. The probationer goes because he's a probationer and I go because I'm new. When we get there, we park on double yellow lines. We're allowed to park here. It's got police written on it, Nina. We parked on a double yellow line and the attitude of, of the officer who is a new officer with hardly any service in at all was, well, it's OK because we're the police. Well, since when were the police above the law? And we have to go to a, the same Chinese because we get massive discount. It's only a pound a head and that's for a full Chinese meal. We had a special request as it's so nice last time. Is it possible we can include some corn toast and spring rolls in it? No. <laughs> we're clearly abusing our authorities, police officers, because we're having a meal for a pound a head, which would probably cost eight pounds a head. We're not allowed to take gifts, we're not allowed to take presents, we're not allowed to have things given us in any way, shape or form. So it's a total breach of what we are allowed to do. Wait here or what? No, we'll go for a swim round for half yeah. an hour. But trying to keep out the busy area so don't pick any jobs up because we signed off for uh, clerical. We signed off for collecting the Chinese. Yeah, that's clerical. The control room the whole time, and it's been over an hour that we've been trying to get this Chinese meal sorted, think that we are doing urgent clerical. And that's what we're signed off as, so we can't be sent to any other job. I'm saying we're on our way there. Was a ridiculous amount too. But actually, we waited over an hour to get a Chinese meal. Go ahead, Nino. Fifteen minutes. I hope you're all hungry. Nina's rejoined the police as the UK's 43 forces are going through their biggest period of change since the 1960s. Across Britain, crime and the fear it creates seems permanently fixed at the top of the political agenda. But when working nights, our undercover reporter found fighting crime seemed to be the last thing on the minds of officers. Yeah, it'll be my, my choice. Yeah. <coughs> what a show. And yours. Most night shifts, my shift, the guys tend to be playing poker or watching a DVD. This infuriates me because that's not how it should be. It's OK for firemen to sit in and play cards or play volleyball or even go to bed. They're reactive. They don't stop a fire by driving round. Police aren't reactive. We are proactive. By sitting in the police station, we're giving the criminals the green light. This wasn't a one-off, this was every single night shift and it's just absolutely disgraceful. But cards wasn't the only game keeping officers from their work. <laughs> this here is the custody suite. The custody suite is the area where prisoners go once they've been arrested or detained. And in here you have civilian officers i.e. people who aren't police officers, working alongside police officers, a custody sergeant. They've decided to play cricket along the corridor, which is all well and good if there's no prisoners there, if you've got nothing to do. But unfortunately here, I was actually waiting with a prisoner to bring them into the custody area. And rather than just stop their cricket and say, OK, Nina's here with a prisoner, they continued to play cricket and I was left to wait. 
time wasting at night was habitual. What follows was recorded on just one night. Okay, do you want to uh, play the game with, uh, with me? What game is that that you want me to play? The hiding About 11 o'clock, I got a radio message from one of the police officers saying, we're going to now start and play hide and seek. The game can't start till 12.30. Apparently that's the rules, that's the law. Ah, uh, OK, uh, I missed that one at uh, Police College. You have to wait till at least after half past 12. Um, because, you know, we can't let members of the public see that we're pissing about in police cars and, and not doing anything. So later on, there was three cars who played hide and seek. I was in one of the cars. I haven't played hide and seek in police car before. And they were telling me that this is how we did it. We had certain rules. That you had 15 minutes to hide, in which people had to try and find you, and you had to stay still at all times. And then every 15 minutes you'd be get given another clue. This can go on for several hours. There they are. Okay. I just oh, the no! What? You blew it. That moment of blinding I them. I ah, pressed the wrong button. I'm all fingers and thumbs. <laughs> The game was finally broken up by an emergency call. Seven hours into the same shift, and all officers are confined to the station. It's half past five in the morning. The radio has went down at five o'clock, so nobody's allowed out until the radios are back on. The lads are playing poker again. Been playing for about an hour. A few more now joining. So at the moment, it's the ideal time to do a crime. You have a clique, which tend to be, I think, the police officers, the boys who join the police force because if they think it makes them macho. And they're the ones who tend to be in the clique who say, well, we can sit and play cards. There's a definite diversion uh, within the shift because you, you have got your officers who are the hard workers and everybody knows that they're the harder working officers. They're the ones who turn out to the jobs. They're the ones who respond first to the incidents that come out on the radio. And it does cause real problem. There's a friction between the people on the shift. As the night comes to a close, that friction becomes clear. Just annoys me that there's no effort made by anyone to help out. To help out. They'll be still, they'll be off at seven, bang on. Yeah. Having spent the last three hours playing cards. Yeah. Whereas I've spent the last three hours or two hours doing a file, then turned out to a job when they asked us to. And then, because they've got your number for going to a job, you, you get sent some shit. Playing cards and other games in the station, rather than patrolling the streets, may not be the most serious offence. But some of what Nina witnessed has a much more direct and serious impact on the public. Police use a chemical spray called CAPTA as a first line of defence against violent prisoners. Sprayed in the face, it incapacitates an attacker by causing their skin to burn and forcing their eyes to close. It's extremely painful. For this reason, officers should have a canister of an antidote called difoterine. At a briefing by this senior officer, Nina and her shift learn how the expensive but vital antidote is to be conserved. The difoterine stuff for the captor. Can the van drivers make sure each of the vans has got some? I don't know where you get it from. That's your mission should you choose to accept it. And if you don't choose to accept it, you're still going to find it. Come because me, okay. the, the chances are the van is going to be at the incident where somebody's been captured. That is for the use of officers. If it's prisoners that get captured, they can be sorted when they're in custody suite. We're not messing about with them. I want it for officers. I'm thinking of your welfare and safety and so that's what I want that use for. All right? It shouldn't be useful for anyway. Well, from the training they said it's used for officers because it costs 50 quid a shot. 
business can bollocks. Well, <laughs> I think that, you know, if that went out in public domain, I think the market should for that. But... On another occasion, Nina was shocked by what happened when two officers near the end of their shift were asked to come to the aid of a woman being roughed up in the street by a man. Despite being very close to the incident, the officers failed to respond. It's three and a half minutes before another unit answers the call from the police control room. I mean, this, is, this is one of the clearest examples you could see of um, dereliction of duty by a police officer. Uh, and astonishing that, you know, they don't know the seriousness of the offence. Uh, that woman could be being dragged down an alleyway, being raped, seriously injured, and yet he's quite prepared just to turn, turn his back on it and drive on. And it seems an appalling piece of behaviour, not one that we expect from our police force. Later in her time with the police, the driver of that patrol car admits to Nina that during the last World Cup, he and his colleague put catching a game of football before his duty to the public. Come by the um, flyover, past the Matthews on your left, and there was this geezer, it must have been about five in the morning, and this geezer was crouching down on the floor, and he had blood pouring out of his fucking wrist. <laughs> I said, see that man over there? He was what man? He says, that man over there, that fucking injury to his arm, he's sort of crouching down, he looks like he's about to pass out, he it just makes my stomach churn. How can you say you are a police officer who has to look after members of the public? That is your job. That to protect life and property is a priority of a police officer. And you then laugh and boast how you drove by somebody. He actually says he was a, looked like he was about to pass out. He might have died. He didn't care as long as he watched his football match. That, to me, he doesn't deserve to wear a uniform and say that he's protecting life and property. Not at all. That wasn't the only time our undercover reporter saw officers putting themselves before the public. On this occasion, Nina and her crewmate had just returned to the station to eat, known in the police jargon as mealing. A grade one job is an incident requiring immediate attention, such as a 999 call. I'd said earlier to that we were the only car that was out and about now, and he said, well, we won't be because we're going in for meal. So a grade one job came out, so... I quickly got my stuff together, went into the canteen and said, We're going to this. We're going to this. No. Good luck the meal, mate. So I went back into PC and said, He's refused to go with me. And at which point she got called to another job because she was the, got the van. He won't go out on me. He says he's not turning out because he's mealing. So do you want me to come with you? Don't, yeah, I'll get him to go. I'll go. Three other officers were mealing at the same time. They all stood up and said we're going. You got, you got, yeah. PC stayed in the canteen all the time. He didn't make any attempt to move. Yeah, do you want me to go? 
it used to be that you had pride in your job and it's that that's missing. I'm so, I was so proud to be a police officer from the day that I joined to the day that I left. These people aren't proud to be police officers. They're doing it so that they can say, I'm a police officer, I'm cool. And that, to me, is the only reason, and he proves that. Nina's disappointed to have uncovered poorly performing and demotivated officers. She's been appalled by the action of two officers in her shift of around 16 who have failed to respond to emergency calls. Coming up, as the government introduced wholesale police reform in an effort to drive up standards, Nina uncovers just how officers are reacting to the changes. Does that defeat the yeah, object of what the government want you to do there? Right. But I There's think no it's so defeated anyway. It demotivates 90% of the uh, staff. The amount of paperwork. You hear this nonsense about cutting paperwork. It's definitely... Undercover reporter PC Nina Hobson filmed the Leicestershire police for four months. She uncovered poorly motivated, sometimes lazy officers and witnessed dereliction of duty. We don't want to attend to this. Yeah, we're going. The government has introduced targets and performance related pay in a drive to improve standards. Most of the police officers hate the targets. They feel that they're doing things differently now purely to make the government happy, purely for the Chief Constable of Leicestershire to put the right figures into the Home Office. Everyone seems obsessed with targets, though. That seems to be the buzzword. I don't really understand it, and that's probably because... I don't think that you're actually assessed on, or one of the key performance indicators is your detection rate and your prisoner rate. So how many prisoners have you got and how many detections have you got? Targets include the number of arrests and detections or crimes an officer has cleared up. The government hopes that the measures will drive down crime. In Leicestershire, these figures play a big part in grading each officer on a scale of one to three. Those officers in Group 1 are eligible for a bonus of up to £2,000. Yeah. But, but if you want my honest opinion, I would never, ever go for a one. Because I, I think it's so divisive and so people get so wound. Why are they better than me? You know, just because they've done this, I've done this. Very, very subjective. Yeah. So my view has been... And if I went for the money, I'd share it with the ship. Yeah. That's what one of our ships yeah. I went on. That's what they did. They picked someone. Right, nine. well, we'll put, we'll put everything yeah. through yeah. here. Yeah. We'll put yeah. everything through yeah. that person. Yeah. And then they shared the money to come. Wow. I thought that was much better. That's teamwork. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I know, but, you know, if you can agree on that, then that's fine. Does that defeat... The object of what the government want you to do there. Right. But I think it's self-defeating anyway. It demotivates 90% of the, uh, yeah. the, the staffing. I, I don't think it motivates those that are exceptional anyway. Those that are exceptional, they know they're exceptional and everybody knows they're exceptional yeah. as well. You know the person who's going out getting their prisoners, always enthusiastic and, and things like that. And they say, well, I'll let rewards them. But, the inspector is talking about the premium which is increasingly attached, as Nina discovered to her horror, to not how well you do your job, it's down to how many numbers you can generate in terms of the numbers of arrests you'll make uh, that results in a detection which the force as a whole can then claim in the figures that it sends back to the Home Office because that's what's driving everything. It's the numbers that count, not how well you do your job. For me, personally, I considered myself to be a good police officer. The jobs that I did, I did to the best of my ability and the victim or the public was always my number one priority. For example, I, I was a rape officer, so I could spend a week with a rape victim which takes me away from being able to achieve my targets, I could then be taken into the office and told, well, you haven't reached your targets. Forget the fact you've been dealing with a rape victim or a child who's been abused. You haven't reached your target. You haven't reached your detection rate. Well, you can't run the police force like that. The targets are being used as a way of trying to motivate the rest by saying, if you give us the right numbers, we'll give you more money. 
So the cynics are just saying, well, OK, if that's a way of earning more money, we'll find ways of giving them the numbers. And we still don't need to do anything because nobody's really supervising us. As Nina and two colleagues complete paperwork in the station, she learns exactly how to create the right numbers. Would you? I would do these yes, to get protections because that's four. Because it used to be that would be because you all they're all doing it. Joint effort, but what they're doing now is protection, sanction protection is the name of the game. Protections are the name of the game. So if we're going to play it like that, and people are saying they've acted independently, then if we're going to play the numbers rule. Then that's for four detection. That's what we did yesterday with the there was four shoplifts, we left one alone, but three. We've done four, three individual crime reports. Which is what I'll be doing. So isn't do that. that why they're saying that we're getting really high crime then? Because Yeah, because we have to do everything. Because you're having to crime it specifically. If we're to turning one crime into four for the sake of the figures, then the public aren't getting a true record of what's really going on. Right. You see, what I would do but... is I'll reprimand one, create the crime report, detect it, mm. I'll do the next reprimand, I'll do the crime report, I'll link it, I'll... Crime... So that way, upstairs won't put them together? It's harder for them to pick up. <gasps> the reason the officers don't want their action to be picked up is that they're breaking the Home Office rules on counting crime. A police inspectorate report on Leicestershire published in October said the force itself had looked into the issue and found significant variances between the Home Office rules and practice on the ground. In the past, in the bad old days, you used to have high detection rates and you used to have what was called, in a euphemism, noble cause corruption, where the result that the police were out to get were to lock up the villains by cutting corners if they didn't have enough evidence, but they would win the case nonetheless. Now, that, of course led to a lot of malpractice. The results thereafter now are simply to make the figures look right. Now, I call that administrative corruption. And as between administrative corruption and noble cause corruption, I'm not sure that we've actually gained very much. Not only have targets changed the force itself, but also the way officers deal with the public. But they're taking away my discretion, whereas I can't sit people down now with a cup of tea and yell at them. It all sorted over the table. Mm. I have to arrest and deal and file and crime. They're taking, they're taking away discretion. There's more arrest now when there doesn't need to be. Um, but you, you're stuck in the way that you feel. There's no such thing as detected in a pain. Right. You can't do that. You have to have a reason why you do it, all the rest of it, and all the rest of it. So you can't say, right, yeah, dealt with it, everybody's happy, they've had a bollocky, which is all they wanted to do the person to have in the first place. The great thing about the police force was we were given discretion. That's now gone, so in the past where you would probably say, don't do it again, you now are actually giving somebody a criminal record because it reaches a target. Once an officer has made an arrest, a decision has to be made whether or not to charge a suspect. Once charged, they'll be going to court. Here too, the government has made changes. The police used to decide who was charged, but now that decision is taken by the Crown Prosecution Service. The government's plan was to cut down on wasted court time. Many officers resent the change and complain that the new system wastes their time with mountains of paperwork. Like, for example, offender details, where you fill it out on the custody record, you fill it out on the Phoenix form, you fill it out on the circumstances form, you fill it out again on the computer on the offender sheet. It's just really repetitive. It's one of the main complaints I hear from police officers is what we're just hearing here, the repetitive nature of their job, how they become more clerical officers rather than police officers. They're not on the street catching the criminals, 
doing what they thought they were signing up to do when they joined the police force. Being convicted of a crime is a three-stage process. Suspects are arrested, some of them are charged, and a proportion of this group are then taken to court. The CPS now have to demand all the paperwork for a trial before they decide whether to charge someone in the first place. This leaves the police feeling they're wasting a lot of time gathering information for cases that'll go nowhere. The process is called preparing a file, and as this CPS lawyer explains, without one, she won't make any decisions. And we won't charge them until their apple pie is yeah. all in order. Yeah. And that's part of that process is, and it's something really that, you know, senior officers here are just going to have to accommodate that. Mm. Yeah, and it needs mm. to come from them. Because... Exactly. It, and it's part of the process, you know, we are up front now with our preparation, mm. not chasing our tails. These demands for trial-ready files frustrate officers who fear they waste too much time preparing for cases that won't go to court, as this senior officer explains. That what they want is a completed, finished article. Yeah. You know, it actually, life doesn't work like that. And there's nothing that says you have to do that. We're, yeah. we're actually in combat with them at the minute. Yeah, I? and I, I said to her, what's the relationship with the police then? And she said, oh, we've got a fantastic relationship. And I thought, that's one thing I've really noticed. It's them and us now. And it did actually, we did used to yeah. work with CPS. Yeah, they are. They're, they're difficult. One of Nina's sergeants believes it's this new CPS system that lies at the heart of the problem of police bureaucracy. The amount of paperwork. You hear this nonsense about cutting paperwork. It's definitely... I know. I know. With CPS taking over the decision-making, they basically want a full file <clears throat> before they make a decision. Yeah. I've had some... A recent Home Office report has found that officers spend 43% of their time in the station and that 41% of that time was spent on preparation of prosecution files and other paperwork. Right, I'll try and get to see him tomorrow. My day's been really frustrating. I feel I've got absolutely nowhere because my prisoner, I don't think, will go anywhere. But it's taken a whole nine hours. Yeah, nine hours to process him. So that's two police officers off the street for nine hours. For, for what? That's reflected very often in, in what we do at police stations as well. I mean, we're now finding we're going back to police stations three, four, five times, sometimes before a decision is made not to charge. And yet government ministers seem somewhat surprised that the cost uh, to the Legal Aid Fund is increasing. And uh, however much we try and explain to them, there's a lot of wastage and wasted time within the system, they don't seem to understand it. Frustration at delays and mounting paperwork often leads to a breakdown in relations between the police and the CPS. Okay, don't, have, don't go up to CPS. And if you do, just poke the bitch's eyes out for me. Okay. Excuse me, are you CPS? Yeah, did you see an officer? Sorry, on. Yes, I did. Ah! <laughs> did you have your MG3 with you or anything? Yeah. Was it signed? Yep. What's the problem then? She was really off. Nina said that she felt awkward in there. It was horrible. She did feel awkward. She was horrible. Was she said we're turning it was, it was at them oh, and yeah. us. The CPS and the police used to work very closely together and it was them v the defence. But now it feels very much that it's the defence, the CPS and the police all pulling in separate directions. The Chief Crown Prosecutor of Leicestershire, Martin Howard, said... I do not believe that this accurately reflects the professionalism of Leicestershire Constabulary or the good working relationship between the police and CPS staff. The charging programme is a new way of working with police which involves the building of robust and sustainable cases from the start. In February 2006, an independent review team conducted a detailed analysis of our charging scheme. They found that both the police and CPS staff had a very good understanding of the principles of charging and there was good evidence of a strong prosecution team approach. After four months filming, 16 years after she first picked up her warrant card, it's time for Nina to leave the police and return to civilian life. 16 years. 16 years. <laughs> with the police but now it's over and I knew that it would be over when I went into making this program but actually the reality is um, it's a lot harder than I thought it would be 
but I hope that everybody realises why I've made the programme and I hope that it changes things for the people who are still in the police, the people who do give up so much to be good police officers and who should be supported and not just totally browbeaten by the bureaucracy and uh, and the government and the system. On January the 24th, 2006, Nina Hobson was awarded the Chief Constable's recognition of outstanding work. Three months later, the Chief Constable watched the programme you've just seen. Well, can I say first of all that I condemn the behaviour shown in the film? Uh, and on behalf of the vast majority of my decent and honourable colleagues, I would like to apologise to those individuals. Um, as soon as we have the footage, we will deal with the matters and the issues very firmly and very swiftly. What we saw in the film suggests there is a culture of sexism permeating the force. Well, can I say for, again that sexism is unacceptable? Uh, it has no place in one organisation, and nearly half of the colleagues I commended last year were female colleagues and valued colleagues. Some of the most shocking material relates specifically to rape and the idea that officers aren't collecting evidence, that they're not taking allegations seriously. In the National League table of forces, you are already well, well down the list. You come something like 30th out of 42 in the number of rapists that you catch. It explains why, doesn't it, when you see behaviour like that? Well, rape is a despicable and horrendous crime, and it makes no difference who the victims are. I need to say that very clearly and very straightforwardly. Uh, rape is a horrendous crime. Um, our detection rate, actually, last year we convicted dozens of people for rape. We have recently carried out a major review of how we conduct rape, and there will be many people who are satisfied with our approach. I don't want a single victim of crime, a single victim of rape not coming forward, because we have many victims who have had a fantastic service from us. We will clearly look at the incident you've shown on this film, we will forensically explore it, and we will learn the lessons from it. What you see is someone joking about driving past a man bleeding in the street, officers not responding to a woman being attacked, isn't that an absolute dereliction of duty? Well, well I'm not going to. I am not going to condone the behaviour of individuals and their neglect of duty. As so soon as, soon as we have the footage, as soon as we have the footage, we will look very carefully at what we have there, and we will deal with it swiftly and firmly. I am not going to condone, on behalf of the vast majority of my good colleagues, colleagues who do not deal with incidents as they should. You know, I'm, I'm going to condemn that behaviour very clearly. What comes through most clearly in part three is a real sense of demoralised good officers who feel they are being suffocated by targets, by bureaucracy. How much sympathy do you have with them? I, I'm a great believer that we are accountable for the public money that we're given. And I'm a great believer that as police officers we have to be accountable for the arrests we make, the detections we have and the quality of what we do. And I think what we see is a, a, a much more intense spotlight on police accountability. I fully support that and I'm fully behind that and it's something that I'm driving through in terms of reform. I believe the vast majority of our colleagues actually accept that because they do an absolutely fantastic job on the people they serve. But if we have individuals that still need to accept their own accountability, we clearly will, will, will take measures to do that. There are already wars over it. Imagine a world without water, Saturday at 7.35. Next tonight, a big cast for a big movie. Robert De Niro, Brad Pitt, Kevin Bacon and Minnie Driver in a tale of revenge. <laughs>